was really into biology, and I thought that would be pretty neat. And so I had my husband contact Rodrigo, who is still working in that lab, who's currently working with Clay, and see if he would be willing to come talk to you. And he was. So you guys have a very special treat today for your lunch with the scientist. This is Rodrigo Gonzalez, and he is going to talk to you a little bit about the play. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really excited. I'm usually um, more used to talk to other scientists. So just warning, if I ever say something, a word, uh, a protein, or something that you don't understand, just let me know. Uh, when we talk to other scientists, we assume that uh, they already understand some of the things that we do, right? But I understand that when you're in high school, there's something that probably you haven't studied yet. So please just feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions. As Mamie said, I am uh, part of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at UNC, and I am a PhD candidate. Um, and the uh, um, uh, focus of my thesis work is plague. Um, so I know that lately you've been talking a little bit about plague in the more or less um, in stuff related to the Middle Ages. And I will address that a little bit today, but mainly I want to talk about the research that we do right now. So I understand that some of you are interested in biology and those kind of things, so I hope that you like uh, what I have to present today. So just to make sure that we understand what we're talking about when I talk about uh, bacterial diseases, um, so I work with microorganisms. They are um, anything, thank you, anything that you have to use a, a microscope to see that's a microorganism. And there are hundreds and thousands of microorganisms, but only a very, very small percentage of them actually can cause disease, and we call them pathogens. So whenever I say a pathogen, I'm referring to a microorganism that can cause disease. We can divide these pathogens into three big groups, and I'm sure you've heard at least from two of them. So viruses, you, I'm sure you know about viruses, bacteria, Again, and parasites are not that well known, but they are the ones that cause malaria and uh, many other diseases. Um, for you to have an idea what they are and the relative sizes, I included this cartoon here. So let's imagine that this is an animal cell, and this is pretty much the same size of a parasite. This, so it would go all this way, so you can imagine how big it is. A bacterium, however, is very small. You can fit many bacteria inside of an animal cell. And a virus is even smaller than that. So you can think of them if um, a parasite is like the Empire State, a car would be a bacterium, and your fist would be a virus. So this is more or less how you can think of the sizes and what they are. Um, today I'm going to talk more about bacteria, because uh, plague is a bacterial disease, as you know. So uh, how does that bacteria actually cause disease? So bacteria, uh, to cause disease, first they need to enter the host. And when I say the host, I mean you, or any person that can be infected. Um, because they are in a different environment outside, they have to adapt to the new environment. So one of the things that they encounter is your immune system. And your immune system is any response of your body that tries to control infection. So believe it or not, every day, whenever you brush your teeth, or whenever you scratch your skin, you're putting bacteria inside of your skin. However, how often do you get infections? Not all the time, right? You rarely need to go to the doctor because of infection. That is not because you haven't been exposed to bacteria, but because your immune system, because you're healthy, you eat well, you sleep well, right? Because of that, then your immune system tries to fight the bacteria. And they have an amazing array of tools that we're trying to understand in my lab and in other, other labs to fight uh, infection. So, however, some bacteria are clever enough that they also develop their own tools to fight your immune system. So when bacteria attempt to survive, that, those attempts to suppress the immune response, that's what we call disease. And there are many, many species of bacteria that can cause disease. Here are pictures, these are real pictures, of uh, bacteria that cause different uh, diseases, like cholera, baby cholera, you've probably heard about it, Treponema pallidum, that causes syphilis, uh, bacillus and traces, that causes anthrax, and mycobacterium tuberculosis, that causes tu tuberculosis or TB. Probably you're a little bit familiar with those names. Um, 
Again, I am interested in Plague, and I know you've been um, studying Plague during the last month or so, right? In this history class, is it? Yes? Okay, so you probably know that Plague um, is thought to be the cause of three pandemics, and what I mean by pandemic is when a whole country or the whole world is infected with something. That's what we call a pandemic. The Black Death, which I think is what you discussed in class, is called also the second pandemic because of the three pandemics that uh, uh, pl the plague caused, the Black Death is only the second one. And uh, it started more or less in 1347 with the first epidemic. An epidemic is an infection of a specific community at a specific uh, time in history. So during a pandemic, you have many epidemics. And the first one was detected in 1347. However, more, epi more epidemics came after this. And uh, for centuries, three or four, or four more centuries, we, are, we say that now we're going through the third pandemic because there's a still plague, and I'm gonna talk about, uh, about it a little bit later. Um, at this point, however, you can imagine, we didn't know that much about many things. So the causes were thought to be uh, from um, the alignments of different stars, the constellations. So the scholars, the experts, the scientists, and the doctors at that time would say, well, the reason why this is happening is because this star is not aligned with this other star, and that causes disease, right? Something that we laugh at right now. Uh, comets, other important cause. You always see a comet, and then, well, you know, you typically don't see comets, now you see one, people get sick, it's gotta be comets. So that's one of the things. Or the wrath of supernatural powers. Some people would think, well, we're doing wrong things, maybe God is upset, uh, and all of these things, right? Um, however, whatever interpretation uh, it was given, because most likely wasn't the right one, it was really difficult to treat. So you know that many, many things happen. So you're telling something important that happened during that time, just a play. Remember anything? Like death, people? Economic change. What? Economic change. Economic change, right? And that's because, because pretty much because so many people were dying, right? That things change a lot. And there's lots of changes in culture. And if you think of arts, art of that specific time pretty much is a representation of the thoughts of that time. For instance, this is a painting by um, uh, Peter Grubel of the Triumph of Death in 1562. And I don't know if you can see it very well from here, but it shows the skeletons everywhere, killing people all over the place. And people were pretty much very scared at that time, thinking that we are all going to die. And one of the most important things that happened in culture that could be seen in art is a representation of this sort of figure here, I hope you can see it really well, which is called the Dance of Death. And from the time where plague started, the, this, this topic, the Dance of Death, was very popular for the next three or four centuries. And what you see is pretty much a skeleton dancing with different members of society. From um, people who uh, take care of the animals to kings. For instance, in this detail, you can see here the king dancing with the skeleton. Meaning, well, you know what? Uh, the king is also susceptible to, to, to play, right? Um, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so again, these are three very important uh, groups of society. The king, right? So people started seeing that the kings, who were powerful, and the were even some of them claimed to be sent by God to govern them, right? Um, they were also dying. The, another group, this is a uh, physician, this is a doctor. He had the knowledge, but he couldn't cure plague, right? And he also would die of plague. Some of the doctors would, would actually die when they try to cure people. And uh, maybe one of the most important ones at that, at that time, this is a cardinal, this is the galero, which is a red hat that represents a cardinal. Um, they were also dying, members of the church. Even the pope was susceptible to plague. So when you right, are part of a population and you, the world, uh, your view of the world is such a, that these three populations are very important and they are kind of sacred, but you see that they are susceptible to this thing, you start questioning. So pretty much what happens is that play uh, makes people question uh, very uh, fundamental ideas about the state, about science, and about religious beliefs. And this caused a really, really huge revolution. 
this, along with a huge number of people that died, um, caused a revolution in thought, and it started what we call the new era at that time, uh, or the Renaissance, that I'm sure that you're gonna discuss, uh, I think it's the next topic that you're going to discuss in your history class. So this is the, uh, the, what I have when it comes to plague and uh, the Black Death, because I know you probably know more than me of this specific topic. But today, I wanna tell you where is plague right now. So the first thing that I want you to remember is that plague is caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. You know, in science, we use Latin-derived names to name the species. So we know which one does what. So the name that they assign to the, to the bacterium that causes plague is Yersinia pestis. You can also see it in books as Y period pestis. It's the way that you abbreviate uh, scientific names. Um, even when we think of plague as an um, ancient disease, I will tell you that it's a re-emerging infectious disease. And re-emerging means that every year, we have more and more reports of plague. And we also have reports in countries that before plague was not existent, or we thought that was not existent. So because of that, the CDC and other uh, organizations, international organizations, determined, well, plague is something that actually never disappeared, and we have to pay attention to. Um, you can see here, this is a girl in Colorado, and she uh, found the carcass of a squirrel that she decided that she wanted to bury. Apparently, the squirrel had um, uh, fleas that were infected with plague. I'm gonna tell you more about this uh, life cycle of plague. And she contracted plague, and she was almost, um, she was about to die, and uh, uh, the doctor was clever enough that determined that it was plague so she could treat it. Um, What's scary about plague is that the symptoms are very simple, fever, chills, and headache. So if you have those symptoms, you think, well, I don't have a cold, right? And you don't, do, you don't do anything about it. Maybe take some Tylenol or something. And that's what happened to this guy over here. This is in Oregon. Uh, this is just in June of this year. This guy found a cat that was choking in a mouse. And he tried to um, remove the mouse from the mouth of the cat. And apparently, the mouse was infected with plague. So he got in contact with some of the blood of the mouse and he got, uh, again, fever, chills, and headache. He didn't know that what he got was plague. When they found out, it was already very, very late, which is something that happens a lot with plague, and he got very, very sick. He almost died. What's really amazing about plague is that it can replicate and disseminate, that means to spread, at very high rates inside of your body. I told you that your immune system, right, is responsible to fight disease, and the immune system is very efficient when it comes to killing bacteria, but that doesn't happen with plague. Plague has something that disrupts your whole immune system, and that's pretty much what I'm studying in my lab, what's what, what, what plague is doing to cause disease. So here you can see the fingers of this guy, and what happens is that once a plague goes into your blood, it causes a systemic inflammatory response. That means that all your body gets inflamed and your organs stop working. And that's called septicemia. And once they are inside of blood, bacteria replicate so much that they form clumps. And those clumps clog your blood vessels. And that does not allow blood to circulate freely in some parts of your body, in this case, the fingers. So pretty much this is dead tissue. And this guy lost his fingers. And most, uh, most of the times when people get plagued and it's not detected uh, uh, really fast, fast enough, people lose a foot or an arm or they die. Any questions so far? No? All right. So there are different forms of the disease. One of them is pneumonic plague. And pneumonic plague uh, happens when you acquire the bacteria after inhalation. That means that, let's say, that you are sick with plague and you start coughing, and I'm next to you, and I inhale those bacteria. Those bacteria go into my lungs, and that's called pneumonic plague. That uh, pretty much causes death because of pneumonia. And the mortality is higher than 90%. That means that if 100 people get the bacteria, and you only need one single bacterium <laughs> to get infected, pretty much 90 will, will die. And this happens between two or four days after infection. So this is really, really fast. Another form of the disease, I don't know if you can read it here, is bubonic plague, the one that I study. And bubonic plague kills pretty much from 50 to 75% of individuals in about five days. And that's the most prevalent form of the disease. It happens in the United States, it happens in the Middle East, it happens in some parts of South America, it happens in Africa a lot. 
Antibiotics are efficacious. That means that you can take antibiotics and they will kill the bacteria, but only if, 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 if the disease is detected early. And for instance, in the case of pneumonic plague, you can take antibiotics only during the first 25, 24 hours after the first symptom. So if people die in two or four days, that means that after the first day of symptom, you have only those 24 hours. If you take antibiotics after that, they don't do anything. We don't have, uh, uh, in, in addition, there are strains that they have found in nature that are resistant to antibiotics. That means that it doesn't matter what antibiotic you take, it doesn't do anything. It will kill you anyway, so it will make you sick anyway. There's no vaccine that has been developed, and also there's recent concerns because um, clay can be used as a bioweapon. And here, I can, I'm showing you a, a color plate of uh, the Mongols invading a European city. And this is the first reported place, uh, uh, the uh, first reported case of um, a uh, bacterium used as a bioweapon. So they would put sick people, people that had clay in catapults, and they would throw us into the walls of the city. And with that, they would have all the city infected, and after they were dead, they would just enter and take whatever they wanted. So in the case of bubonic plague, which is what I study, uh, we know that Yersinia pestis, this bacterium, disseminates or spreads from the skin um, to other organs. So this is the gut of the flea, the purple part. And you can see that it's covered by this yellow thing, and those are the, the bacteria. So when a flea is infected, it gets really hungry, and it needs to take a blood meal from a host, the host being a, a human, for instance. Uh, but the flea has bacteria inside, and when they bite, they deposit bacteria into the skin. Then the bacteria travel from the site of infection to the proximal lymph node. And the lymph node is an organ that you have in your body that prevents the spread of disease. So bacteria move to the, uh, are brought to the lymph node, and they're killed there. When pestis, when your senior pestis goes into the lymph node, the lymph node gets swollen or inflamed. And you get this thing here, and that's an inflamed uh, lymph node, and that's called a bubo, and that's why we call it bubonic plate. Bacteria are not supposed to escape from that because your body is so good at keeping it bacteria inside, but plate can do it. We don't know how, but it escapes, and after escaping, it invades the rest of your body, and that's what pretty much makes you sick, and that's what kills patients, bacteria spreading in, the, in, in your body. How does it do that? Typically, we have um, cells of our immune system called macrophages, and this is this cell here in green. Macrophages, every time they see a bacteria, something that does not belong to the body, they eat it. So here you're seeing macrophages eating bacteria. These ones are about to be eaten. And the macrophages have different chemicals inside that destroy bacteria completely. And that's what you expect to happen all the time. But plague has many tricks to prevent that to happen. One of them is the production of a capsule. And you see here a plague bacteria without a capsule, and this is plague bacteria producing this capsule. And what happens is that when a macrophage approaches to eat it, the bacteria produces this capsule. And this is like a shield. And this shield prevents the macrophage to eat it. So that's just one of the hundreds of things that, that your senior pestis does to, to make your um, to, to disrupt the function of your immune system. Another one, I think it's a very cool one, it's more aggressive. So the bacteria produces needles. You can see these micro needles here in the microscope. This is exactly like a needle that they use when you get a vaccine. So this, but very, very little. They produce this needle and they produce different proteins inside that have different functions to the macrophage. So when the macrophage, the cell of the immune system, approaches to kill it, the bacteria injects these proteins, and this paralyzes the macrophage, and then kills it. So as you can see, then your immune system has nothing else to do, and the bacteria can survive happily inside of your body and cause disease. How do we study um, plague right now? How is that I'm trying to understand how plague works? Well, DNA is very important. We isolate DNA. We are probably familiar with what DNA is. And that, for instance, has developed molecular archaeology, where they obtain DNA from um, people that died during the Black Death. And they have so just now really proven that what caused the Black Death was actually DNA, was actually the bacteria Yersinia pestis, because they could isolate DNA from this bacterium. What I'm more interested in is um, medical microbiology. That means how to treat and how to cure people that are infected. 
So we work in a biosafety level three laboratory. That means a very, uh, very, um, uh, a laboratory that is protected from many things, very safe, very secure. And we typically wear this personal protected equipment. So every time I work, I have to wear this. It's like an astronaut suit. I just connect it to this hose here. And every time we manipulate bacteria, we put it inside of this cabinet that has a, a secure system. So only um, very clean air can circulate and nothing comes out of here. And there are like three doors that you have to pass to enter this laboratory. You have to mark a code, you have a card, and many other things. Maybe you've seen some movies where they do this kind of thing, but it's kind of like that. Um, we use models to study the disease. We cannot infect humans, so we use animal models and we use mice. Mice are very important for our work, and we uh, infect them to study what the reaction is when, when, when you get played. And we also use genetics and molecular biology, which means that we manipulate the DNA. For instance, the bacteria typically are not fluorescent, but I put some genes of some fluorescent organisms, so now my bacteria can fluoresce. And typically, I inject in the mouth of the ear to study how they disseminate from there to the rest of the organism. And, uh, the last thing I'm going to describe is one of the methods that we use to, to study dissemination. So, as I told you, uh, I'm interested in to see how bacteria move inside of the mouse, right? And uh, one of the methods that you can use is in vivo imaging. That means that you can image the mouse and see how bacteria move there. Um, Yersinia pestis does not produce light, and for this to work, I needed to produce light. So I get genes from other organisms that produce light, like a firefly, for instance, one of them. You get genes from that organism, and then you put it in DNA that has this circular form, and then you mix it with your bacteria. Bacteria acquire this DNA and make it part of its genome, and then the bacteria are able to produce light. So after this, we call it transformation, to put DNA of, of this organism here, your bacteria, you put it in a flask and you see it jet making light. How is this useful? Well, after I infect my mice with bacteria that produce light, I can put it in this chamber that has a very sensitive camera here. This is a very expensive machine, it's about half a million dollars, it's very expensive. You put your animal here, and the animal, the bacteria that are inside of the animal are producing light. And that allows you to keep track of, of where bacteria move. So you, this is the back of the mouse, and this is after an infection in the nose. And you can see that at 24 hours, there is no light, because there's so little bacteria, they haven't moved anywhere. But 48 hours later, you can see that the bacteria move to whatever seems to be the lungs. And uh, later, they are in the lungs, and they are pretty much everywhere. You can see here in the skin, like the tail, there is light. That means the bacteria are disseminating there. If you open the animal and compare it to an infection that is not in, uh, done through the, through the nose, you see that the lungs are actually the ones that are glowing. That means that after you put bacteria into the nose, they actually move into the lungs. And this is a nice way for us to follow where bacteria move. Uh, the last example, it's an example where I put bacteria um, in the ear, just as I, as I show you here. So you put it in the ear, and at different times you start seeing different spots where the bacteria move. First, the lymph node, which is that organ that I told you that contains bacteria, um, which drains that ear, it's glowing really high. And after this, the bacteria start moving to the rest of the body, that's why you see the body glowing. And you can see, these are exactly the same animals, but at different time points, so you can see how the animal that is glowing here, it's gone at this time, it already died. And this animal here, same story. The only one that survived is this one, but at this time point, it's already glowing. So you can already see that it's disseminated everywhere. Because we want to know exactly what organs are colonized or are invaded by the bacteria, we dissect the animals. And here you see that ear, when you put the bacteria, um, they are act the ear is glowing, meaning that bacteria actually stay at the ear. But also the lymph nodes are glowing, and the spleen, which is an organ that we use to assess dissemination to the rest of the body, is also glowing, and also the liver. So at this point, all the, organis all the organisms are pretty much um, infected, and that's what caused the, the, the death of the mice. Um, so this is what I have, and this is pretty much what we do to study and understand plague using an approach with molecular biology and uh, with DNA to understand how they disseminate. And hopefully, this will give you more knowledge in understanding how the bacteria cause disease so we can target those things that bacteria do and we can design drugs to prevent this to happen. If we understand that at some point the bacteria are weak in a specific organ, 
we can study what happens in that specific organ that, that makes the bacteria weak, and hopefully develop, again, a drug that would um, increase that response of the host. And then hopefully, when people get sick of plague or other uh, bacterial diseases, we can give them that drug and it will be more efficacious than what we have right now. And I don't know if you have any questions of anything. Tell me. Have you ever worked with Ebola, last fever, or Legionnaire's disease? No, uh, those first two that you mentioned are considered a BSL-4. So I mentioned that we do BSL-3. There are different scales in laboratories. BSL-1, 2, 3, and 4. So 3 are for this kind of pathogens, but then you can still fight them with antibiotics or something. 4 is something that you cannot fight. And there's only two or three in the country, and they're more, they're, I think all, they all, all of them are located in military facilities. So it's more restricted access. Maybe after I do this, I can I get an offer to work in one Ebola is not bad. Ebola is really bad. Ebola is really bad. Because Legionnaire's disease is not that bad. That's a, that's that's not that that actually I think it's BSL two. It's not even BSL. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um. So can you like? Is there any way to try infection with um like with that you're just resistant to antibiotics, like you fight that or anything, or treat it? There's no way to treat it. Once you do an infection with that, it's either your immune system is strong enough to fight it, or there's nothing else you can do. Yes? Um, so, our, like, bacteria are rapidly dividing into cells, right? Yes. So, uh, and, and there's one method to treat cancer is to like use UV lights to kill rapidly dividing into cells. Right. So, could you use uh, UV light lights to to kill the bacteria? That would be a great idea. However, whenever you find something inside of your body, you have to be careful because you also have cells that are susceptible to this treatment. So, bacteria are more or less easier to treat because they're so different than us that you can target those things that are different, but our cells are also susceptible to UV light. And bacteria, as opposed to cancer, that they focus on a tumor, right? You can target only that tumor. Bacteria go everywhere. And by the time that you detect infection, they are in your, in, your, in your blood. That means that you have to UV your whole body. And that could cause burns, and that can, can also cause cancer, because UV can cause cancer. So it's very tricky to really establish what can be used to treat things. And there are many ideas like that, and then you test them, and like, well, bacteria have clever ways to do this. Mm -hmm. And we just, and we try one after the next, one after the next. But it's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did Brian, did you have a question? Oh, no. No? Anybody else? I have another one. Yes, sure. So, um, can you, like, get pipe like, they it, like, if you have to, like, 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 well, that's a great question. So there are cases in the Middle East of people that eat camels, and camels sometimes uh, are infected with plague. So it happens that they go to a party, the camel is not well cooked, and the camel was infected, so they develop a rare form of plague that pretty much spreads in your neck. And from your neck, it happens all the other stuff. We don't think that, that, that plague can go through your stomach and survive, but we don't know if it's just because they actually survive here better, and you don't see what happens here. But so far, we don't believe that that, that, that they can go, uh, that they can survive in your stomach. But they just can't survive anywhere else. So by the time they get in your stomach, they're probably disseminated from here. All right, well, it's time to move to class, but let's give a real big thank you.